In this clip, I introduce the issue of heteroscedasticity. Let's first uh, define what that means. We speak of heteroscedasticity if the homoscedasticity assumption, that's either A5 or time series assumption 4, is preached. Let's consider the model here written down in the observation wise form. The homoscedasticity assumption A5 stated that the variance of the UIs conditional on the XIs is equal to sigma squared for all observations, so it's constant. In matrix form, let's restate the model in matrix form, we would say that the variance of u conditional on x is equal to sigma squared times the identity matrix. At the end of the clip we'll get back to this issue of what that means. Now it turns out that if that assumption is preached, then we have what we call heteroscedasticity. Why is it important? A5 was not important to prove unbiasedness of all S coefficient estimators, nor was it important to prove consistency of beta hat all S. But A5 was a part of the Gauss Markov assumptions, and the Gauss Markov assumptions were used to establish that the all S parameter estimators were blue. What did that mean? Best linear unbiased estimator. It turns out that it is that best issue that now is not the case anymore if we have heteroscedasticity. The OLS estimator is not efficient anymore. We also used A5 to derive the result that beta hat OLS was normally distributed with mean beta and variant sigma squared times x prime x inverse. Now, the fact that the expected value is beta was that unbiasedness feature, and that still remains. But if A5 is breached, then the variance of beta at all S is not going to be any longer sigma squared times x prime x inverse. So, when would we expect A5 to fail? Let's consider cross-sectional data, and let's think about, we'll make a little thought experiment about household expenditures, the dependent variable, which is some sort of function of household income. Think of ho holiday expenditure, for instance. So we, here we have a little graph, income goes from low to high, and we expect for most normal goods some sort of positive relationship. Now it turns out that you will often find that if you look at individual households for the low income households, the observations will lie fairly close to that sort of line of best fit, but for high incomes we'll find the observations quite spread around, and medium incomes somewhere in between. So let's say we estimate a linear regression relationship, that may be the blue line. Now the distances of the observations from that line are the estimated residuals, the UI hats. Now it turns out that we have large values of absolute values of UI hat for high incomes and low values of absolute UI hat for low income values. Now these absolute values of the regression residuals are often used as some sort of measure of the variance of the error terms. Alternatively, we could have used the squared values of the error terms, and we again we get large values for high income and small values for low income observations. When we are dealing with time series data, there's also a case where we're where we quite typically observe heteroscedasticity. For instance, if we are looking at stock market returns. RT, now we have T subscripts to indicate that these are time series data rather than I subscripts. Consider we estimate this AR1 model and it turns out that when we have this AR1 model, remember that this green bit, this is the predicted return and we know for financial data that the predicted return will contain very little variation most of the variation will be in the use, which are the surprises or the unpredicted returns, and most of the returns are unexplained and unpredicted. Now it turns out that the variance of that error term is a measure of risk of your investment, and this variance tends to be varying through time a lot. So that is also a breach of assumption A5 because that would assume constant variance. Next form, next reason for us to observe heteroscedasticity is function form misspecification. Often the fact that we see heteroscedasticity may be indicative of us having a misspecified model. 
So what do we need to consider? We need to consider the consequences, how to detect, and what to do if heteroscedasticity is present. The first thing we're going to look at is the consequences of heteroscedasticity. So here's our model, y equals x beta plus u. Now let's recall the derivation of the variance of beta hat. Here's our OLS estimator beta hat, and if we replace the y with the model, we'll uh, substitute the model equation in here, and then we do a little bit of algebra, and we get these terms, then we recognize that these two guys cancel out, so we get beta hat equals beta plus x prime x inverse x prime u. Now the u is a random variable, and therefore the beta hat is a random variable. We do know that in general x's are also random variables, but for the time being we'll condition on a particular outcome for this random variable x. So, and now recall the assumption A4, the expected value of u conditional on x is zero, that was the zero conditional mean assumption. And with that zero conditional mean assumption we can now take expectations, conditional expectations, conditional on x of beta hat, and we just replace in our formula for beta hat up here, and this needs to be conditioned on x as well. Now, we understand that uh, the expected value of beta is a constant, it's unknown but constant, so we can take that out. The x's we condition on them, so we can take them out of the expectations operator, so we end up with this term, and this we assume to be zero due to the zero conditional mean assumption, and therefore we find that our expected value of beta hat conditional on x is equal to beta. Now, using a law of iterated expectations, we can establish, therefore, that the unconditional expectation of beta hat is equal to beta as well. The application of the law of iterated expectations was explained in the random regressors clip. So far, the presence of heteroscedasticity hasn't made much of a difference. Now, however, when we look at the variance of our random variable beta hat conditional on x, we'll find differences. So let's look at the formula here. It's going to be the variance. Now we replace beta hat with x prime x inverse x prime u, and then conditional on x. So you may wonder, where, where is the beta gone to? Because our equation for beta hat is beta plus x prime x inverse x prime u. But recognize that beta is unknown, but it is a constant, and therefore it doesn't contribute to any, any random variation. And as any constant, additive constant, inside the variance operator, you can ignore it. Next, recognize that we are conditioning on x, and therefore that term x prime x inverse can be taken out of the variance operator. As it is a matrix, we pre-multiply and post-multiply with that matrix prime, but it's an uh, cross product matrix so it's symmetric so prime doesn't make a difference and then we do the same with the x bar x prime we pre multiply with x prime and then we post multiply with x prime prime which is just x let us introduce a new term the variance of u conditional on x that's a matrix and let's call that omega and now if the error terms are homoscedastic therefore assumption 5 holds, then that omega we learned and we discussed can be simplified to sigma squared times the identity matrix. Okay, let's just go back up to our assumptions. Where did we have it here? Okay, that was the matrix form of our homoscedasticity assumption. So, when that is the case, then we can simplify the above conditional variance equation somewhat. Now we'll replace the variance u conditional on x with an uh, omega, but that omega can be written as sigma squared times the identity matrix. Now sigma squared, that is a scalar, and that can therefore just be moved to the front. So we'll just replace, we just move that. And then that identity matrix doesn't do anything in that multiplication. So 
x prime identity matrix times x is the same as x prime x. Now we have x prime x and x prime x inverse. We know that will just cancel out to the identity matrix, but we can let it, leave it away. So that's our new result. This is of course our well-known result. You've learned that already. That's the variance we get if the Gauss-Markov assumptions hold. If, however, f5 fails to hold, then this variance covariance matrix omega cannot be simplified and our conditional variance of beta hat remains that somewhat larger, more complicated formula and cannot be simplified. Recall this omega was just for short form for the variance of u conditional on x. And that was just a short form. Now what have we learned? If a5 holds, then we can simplify omega and we get our well-known variance equation. If a5 fails to hold, the conditional variance of beta hat is that longer, more complicated formula. So there's a difference. Heteroscelasticity does make a difference. Let's remind ourselves what uh, sigma squared times identity matrix means and further we will also still discuss how we get very briefly though from the conditional variance of beta hat to the unconditional variance. But let's start with the issue of omega being equal to sigma squared times the identity matrix. Omega was the variance covariance matrix of u conditional on x. Now u is a vector, let's say an n by 1 vector, and therefore the variance covariance result of u is going to be an n by n matrix. So let's just sketch a matrix here. What we have is on the 1, 1 element, the variance of u1, the 2, 2 element, the variance of u2, all the way on the diagonal down to the variance of un. Then on the off diagonal, we have covariances, covariance of u1 and u2. So we have a symmetric matrix here, covariance between u1 and u3 here in the 3, 1 element, and so forth. So basically, on the diagonal, we have the variances. On the off diagonal, we have the covariances, and they are symmetric. So we have a symmetric matrix here. Now the covariances, if we assume that there's no autocorrelation, then these will be zero. Okay, so if we have no autocorrelation, we get zeros on the off diagonal in these uh, green bits. Okay, so all these values here in the green bits will be zero. The variances, if we have homoscedasticity, then each variance for all individual error terms are going to be the same. That's the feature of homoscedasticity. So we will have sigma square on all elements in the diagonal. Let's move that a little bit up. That means we can simplify that omega to sigma square times the identity matrix. Okay, so that's why we can say omega is equal to sigma squared times the identity matrix if we have homoscedasticity and one should also mention no autocorrelation. So let's go back to that other question, how to go from the conditional variance to the unconditional variance of Peter Hat. Well actually I'm not going to discuss that here but there is a clip on random regressors in which we discuss how this works. Now, what are the consequences for inference if we have heteroscedasticity? Now, for inference, we usually need an estimate of the variance of beta hat. For instance, for t-tests, which look like this, we need the, if it's a test on the j element of beta, we need the standard error of the j estimate, and that we get from the variance covariance matrix for beta hat. Now, if assumptions A1 to A6 are met, this is going to be t-distributed. If the normality assumption isn't met, that was A6, then we have asymptotic standard normal distribution for this t-test, so if only A1 to A5 are met. Now if we use an incorrect formula to get this standard error, for instance, we use this simple formula sigma squared times x prime x inverse, if there is heteroscedasticity, then the t-test will not be distributed as indicated here. In fact, we won't know how it is distributed, therefore we can't perform on any inference. Inference is invalid. That means that we have incorrectly sized tests. Just a quick reminder of what that means. If you, for instance, set an alpha of 5%, we would expect to reject a correct null hypothesis 5% of times. If you have an incorrectly sized test, we may reject more or less often. So just a quick summary of what we've learned so far. If there's heteroscedasticity, then beta hat or less is not efficient. So that's important to 
combat that, we could consider using what's called a generalized least squares estimator, and um, there will be discussions on that. Second, when we perform inference, we want to use the correct formula for the variance of beta hat. So for both of these aspects, of course, it's crucial that we know if there's heteroscedasticity or not. So detection is absolutely crucial. So let's ask a couple of questions to test your understanding. Here we have a regression model, which you can read. So we have two explanatory variables. We have cross-sectional data indicated by the I subscript. And assume that all gauss markov assumptions, but the homoscedasticity assumption hold. So we have all assumptions hold from gauss markov but for the homoscedasticity assumption. Which of the following statements is correct? A. The OLS estimators for alpha naught, alpha 1 and alpha 2 are unbiased. B. The OLS estimators for these coefficients are efficient. C. There exists an estimator for alpha 2 that has smaller variance than the OLS estimator for alpha 2. And D. Despite the heteroscedasticity, we can perform a t-test on alpha 1. So pause the clip and think. Here are the answers. Firstly, A, the OLS estimators for these coefficients are still unbiased despite heteroscedasticity. We discussed that. And the OLS estimators are not efficient anymore. C. There exists an estimator for alpha 2 that has smaller variance than the OLS estimator. Now that refers, that smaller variance seems to indicate that there's another estimator that may be efficient. And indeed such an estimator exists. I hinted at that, the GLS estimator. And despite heteroscedasticity, we can perform a t-test and that is correct. We just have to use the correct variance formulation. Here comes the second question. Consider the following regression model written in matrix form. Set equals Q times gamma plus W. You know that the variance of W conditional on Q is equal to omega. And that is unequal to sigma squared times the identity matrix. And we also consider that the zero conditional mean assumption holds. Which of the following are correct representations of the variance of gamma hat conditional on Q? A. B. C. And or D. Several answers are possible. Pause the clip and think. Here are the answers. This one is really the variance formulation for the case of homoscedasticity. So homoscedastic error terms W in this case. Since they are not, as was clearly indicated here, answer A is not correct. Now answer B is indeed the correct formula. So this is exactly the same as the formula with the axis, just allowing for the different model formulation. C is really assuming that this omega can be replaced by sigma squared times the identity matrix. But up here in our question, we said that this was not the same. Therefore, C is incorrect. D turns out to be correct. To see this, just imagine we're conditioning on the Q in this variance term. So we can take that Q outside. That means pre and post multiplication. So pre with Q prime and post with Q prime prime, which is just Q. Then uh, that Q prime inside the variance operator will fall away. So we have variance W conditional on Q. And that is of course nothing else but the omega. And once we've done that, we see that solution D is really exactly the same as solution B and therefore 
it is correct.